Hi there, and welcome back to Good Distinctions. I'm your host, Will Wright, and Good Distinctions are the spice of life. I am honored today to be joined by uh, Dr. Chris Kayser. Uh, Dr. Kayser, welcome. Hey, thanks very much. Good to be here. Excellent. So just to start us off, as I do with all my guests, just tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and what you do. Okay. Uh, I'm a professor of philosophy and also an honorary professor in the Word on Fire Institute. And what do I do? I teach students and I write uh, scholarly articles and books and also write books and articles for a more general audience. And right now I'm chair of the philosophy department. So I'm doing a lot of <laughs> stuff like that. Um, and I've got a family and I do... What else do I do? I like to do jujitsu. Um, like to play piano. So yeah, pretty good. Excellent. And so, one of the reasons that we're we're speaking today is uh, we uh, have a mutual uh, acquaintance, Samantha Stevenson, who I interviewed um, at the time that we're recording that episode uh, dropped yesterday. So very excited uh, to get to know her, and uh, she was one of your students. And so that's very exciting. But I uh, I read one of your books in my master's program uh, from quite a while ago now. And, uh, and and so that was my first exposure to you. But the reason we're speaking today, I don't know if this will come up on the camera, but we'll try anyway. Yeah, I see uh, it. Not so much, but How to Be Happy. Um, and that's produced by Word on Fire, published by Word on Fire. Sorry, let me pull How to be... Alarm. Sorry about that. No worries. I'll edit it out. Okay. So this book uh, from Word on Fire, published by Word on Fire, is How to Be Happy, Meaning, Faith, and the Science of Happiness. And uh, I, I absolutely loved it uh, for multiple reasons. The first reason is that it's incredibly practical. Um, I usually, whenever I'm, I'm plugging a book on the show, I'll say everyone should go buy it, but, but this one is, uh, is free. So people can That's go right. to Word on Fire, and I'll put the link in the show notes for that. So you have no excuse to not go and get it and read it. Um, and, uh, and so that's from word on fire. I'm just looking here for the table of contents just to kind of walk folks through. Uh, it's a, a book about positive psychology, the interaction with faith, uh, and then obviously a philosophical lens, but something you say at the end of the book, um, really resonated with one of the goals here at Good Distinctions. For those who aren't regular listeners of the show, Good Distinctions is devoted to inspiring, uh, reigniting good conversations, seeking out the best distinctions, and inspiring others to do the same. And one of the main themes uh, that I keep coming back to is that faith and reason are not in conflict. In fact, they, they support one another. And that's, that's how you end. You say, this book is a new twist on the classic insight that faith and reason work in harmony. So just to jump us off, I guess, what uh, what impelled you to write this book? Well, this book kind of arose out of personal experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened basically is that I went through a kind of uh, personal crisis of happiness and meaning, and I was very depressed and feeling very mm -hmm. down. And so uh, since I'm a scholar, I do what scholars do. I Googled how to be happier. <laughs> and uh, and I was surprised to learn all about this new field of positive psychology. And the more I read about positive psychology, the more I was shocked, really, to see that empirical research had actually verified the importance and the efficacy of many traditional Christian practices. So, yeah. for instance, the practice of gratitude, uh, the positive research, positive psychology researchers studied this in depth and the way they study medications with, you know, double blind, uh, you know, two different groups and you don't know who's doing the intervention, who's getting it, who's not. Yeah. And basically what they found is that uh, gratitude is a powerful intervention that helps people overcome depression and helps them to uh, actually enjoy and see the good that's already present in their lives. And then obviously in the Christian tradition, gratitude is a very central uh, piece of this uh of Christian practice. We have gratitude, uh, certainly in terms of Thanksgiving. I mean, we have a whole day in the United States, Thanksgiving day. <laughs> and if you're Catholic, it's really part of the Catholic tradition very much because we celebrate the Eucharist and that's just the Greek term for Thanksgiving. So in 
thinking about positive psychology, basically I saw these overlaps again and again where mm -hmm. empirical psychology was basically confirming the wisdom and the uh, helpfulness of these traditional Christian practices. And so, you know, the more I studied positive psychology and the more I saw those overlaps, I thought, well, this is really interesting and it's worth sharing with other people because uh, in a way, as I said in the book, it, it's a little bit like uh, Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century where mm. he has this famous five ways to argue for God's existence. And what he mm. was saying basically is if we take Aristotelian reasoning seriously, we come to the conclusion there has to be an uncaused cause. There has to be some God behind it all. And so he was making an argument then that faith and reason are really working together. Reason, as represented by Aristotle, doesn't contradict faith, but really supports faith. And I think the same thing's mm -hmm. true of contemporary positive psychology. Well, and what, what does that term mean, positive psychology? Because <clears throat> I think a well, lot of people in their mind who, especially folks who are listening, who haven't looked into it scholarly uh, and academically, um, we'll see, okay, psychology, I'm thinking about Freud and someone sitting on a chaise, and there's obviously a lot more to psychology now, but uh, what makes it positive psychology? So the term arose uh, and is used by Martin Seligman, and he was the president of the American Psychological Association uh, mm. around the year 2000. And he basically, as a psychologist, noted that there was a, a kind of lopsided emphasis in psychology up to that point. So he told his fellow psychologists, you know, we focused a lot on the negative, like mm. depression, anxiety, bipolar, borderline personality, uh, all these negative things. And that's important to study. There's no denying that we should study those things. But he said there's another part of the human experience, the positive part. So resilience, courage, signature strengths, uh, compassion, people who grow through difficult uh, situations rather than be crushed by them. And so he said to them, look, we need to focus not just on the negative psychology of depression, anxiety, et cetera, but also what he called the positive psychology of how do we build more strengths? How do we have greater optimism? How mm -hmm. do we grow to have more meaning in life? So the term positive psychology basically is uh, a branch of psychology that's going to focus for the most part on the more positive side of human emotion and human experience. Again, things like gratitude, resilience, courage, um, you know, wisdom, love, compassion, rather than just an exclusive focus on the negative, depression, mm -hmm. anxiety, et cetera. Well, and that, uh, that certainly plays well with um, Aristotelian ethics or, or natural theology, whichever way you want to look at it. Of, of virtue as something that we have to grow in, that it's like a muscle that's that's worked out. And you mentioned this in the book uh, often, uh, that it's you can't just fall into these habits. These are, they truly are hab habits, things that are, are worked upon day in and day out. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there's a, <laughs> there's definitely a push in our broader society to, examine these things that we know to be true from the lens of psychology uh, or from rationality. Uh, but I love that exchange that you do in the book that it's, it's not, um, you're not so, sort of seeking out to prove Christianity as you're investigating these things. But as you said, what you're finding is that all along the way, the Christian tradition is supported by everything that we're coming to know from this different angle. Um, as yeah. you said, that Aquinas approach of the converging and convincing arguments that um, God did create an intelligible order. He created us in such a way that we actually do reflect an intelligibility uh, and that there's a way that we're ordered and it's not just random. It's not just by chance. Um, and that, that gives us the ability to go out and intentionally work on those muscles, work on those muscles of virtue. Um, one of the things you bring up in the book is, is mindfulness. Uh, and so I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit, because you, you go through a few different um, lenses that mindfulness is viewed within the church. Uh, and so I'd love you just to speak on that. Sure. There is a bit of a controversy about the relationship you might say between mindfulness and Christian practice. Mm. And so some people 
of worry and fear that mindfulness practices can be a kind of substitute for the practice of the faith. And I think there's some legitimacy to that worry. If somebody said, mm -hmm. hey, I don't need to worry about loving God. I don't need to worry about going to mass. I'm just going to do mindfulness and I'm all set. That, mm -hmm. you know, I agree. That would be very problematic. But I don't think we have to use mindfulness practices in that sort of way. Mm -hmm. I think that the better way to think about mindfulness practices would be a little bit like exercises for the mind. And just mm -hmm. as there's no contradiction at all between doing physical exercises, let's say someone who walks or runs or swims or whatever, there's no contradiction between doing physical exercise and also keeping a spiritual life very active. So mm -hmm. too, I don't think there's any contradiction between doing uh, exercises for the mind and keeping the spiritual life very active. So even though the people who worry about a kind of substitution, I think have a legitimate point. Uh, my, my reply to that would be, well, you know, really anything can be abused, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you could say, I'm going to, uh, I don't know, uh, rather than go to mass, I'm going to, you know, take a walk. Well, that would show that taking walks is bad, right? I mean, anything can be done at the wrong time, the wrong way, mm -hmm. et cetera. So what is mindfulness? Mindfulness, as I say, is a kind of mental exercise where you repeatedly focus and refocus on whatever it is you're focusing and refocusing on. So often it's mm -hmm. your breathing, but it doesn't have to be. It could actually be uh, mindfulness by means of a visual focus. So you look at a particular point, and if you do that, your mind's going to wander away, and then you bring it back, and your mind's going to wander away again. You can bring it back. And basically, just as physical exercise strengthens your muscles, these sort of mental exercises can strengthen your mind. And if the empirical evidence is correct, and there's been many, many studies done about mindfulness, there are some serious benefits um, mm -hmm. for most people with doing these practices. And I say most people deliberately because, again, it would be like any sort of practice. Is uh, swimming good for everyone? Well, no. I mean, if, if you are paralyzed from the legs down, you might drown if you swim. So it's not like, you know, yeah. everybody should swim uh, or everybody should walk because there's some people who can't walk for whatever reason. So, but you could say this, in general, for everyone, exercise of some kind is good. And I think you could say the same thing about exercises for the mind. Like, it's just not good for any human being just to sit around and just watch TV all day long or something. This is not good for your mind. Now, what, do you have to do mindfulness practices per se? Well, no, I don't think so. I mean, you could play the piano, you could do crossword puzzles, you could just read a book. There's lots of things you can do to keep your mind kind of active and healthy. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, my, there is a lot of empirical evidence that these mindfulness practices, like counting your, your, your breaths and refocusing on your breathing, have some benefit for many, not all, but many people. So anyway, in the book, I kind of talk about these practices and suggest that <clears throat> as people of faith, we don't have to uh, be afraid of these practices or say, oh, we have to condemn these practices. Now, it is true that many of these practices arise in the East and with mm -hmm. Buddhism, for example. But I don't think, again, I don't think that means we can't practice those, uh, you know, those things because they arise from a different culture. Uh, if we think of wrestling, the first people who wrestled weren't Christian. This is a pre-Christian activity. Now, does that follow that therefore Christians should never wrestle? Well, no, it's nothing wrong with joining a wrestling team or in high school or whatever, or swimming was something people did before, you know, existed before Christianity, but there's nothing wrong at all or anti-Christian somehow about swimming. Mm -hmm. So I don't see anything wrong in itself at all about doing these kinds of mindfulness activities. Um, now, it is a bit of a controversial opinion, though, because there will be people who see that this is very dangerous and we can't have any pagan you know, practices or, or influences on the church. But I think that kind of view actually is kind of historically naive. Mm -hmm. There are many, many things that we do in the church, for instance, wearing wedding rings that originally had a pagan origin. Another example would be Christmas trees. Christmas trees really have an originally a pagan origin. Uh, now, does that mean Christmas trees are evil and wrong? Well, no, right? I mean, there are pagans who had legitimate insights. And whether those pagans are in the East or the West, I don't think that really determines whether their insights are legitimate. So I'm trying to draw here in a way on Aquinas. And what I, what I was trying to do in the book is say, well, if Aquinas were to look at the practice of mindfulness, you know, what would he say? And my best guess is he'd probably say, this is a legitimate kind of thing. 
Mm-hmm. And like any practice could be misused. Yes. But again, that's true. <laughs> that's true of literally everything, right? You can think of reading, nothing wrong with mm-hmm. reading. Could you do that in a, in a harmful way? Of course. Yeah, I mean, if all I did was read and my, my wife's like, Hey honey, the kids need this and that. I'm like, no, honey, I got to read. And I just read, you know, 18 hours a day and, and the kids need help. My wife needs help. I just ignore them. Well, that's a problem. Now, does that mean reading is problematic? Well, no. Reading is perfectly fine to do and a good thing to do. But mm-hmm. yeah, like everything at the right time in the right way in the right circumstances. Um, so I think the same thing's true of mindfulness. Well, that distinction is is incredibly important. And uh, Aquinas, I agree, Aquinas would, would definitely sift through it that way. That's where the inspiration for this channel came from uh, was Aquinas's maxim, seldom affirm, never deny, always distinguish. Uh, and so we have to sift through because if we just throw out everything that mildly looks pagan, we're going to be throwing away something good and true. Uh, and I, I know that that's definitely the, the people that are in my um, orbit, so to speak, in the Catholic world around me are very open um, to the approach that I think groups like Word on Fire are doing a very good job of, which is sifting through things properly. Uh, like, for example, I, I know you wrote a, a book on Jordan Peterson a couple of years ago. Um, and he's a very interesting character. I, I think I listen to everything he puts out, um, but I wouldn't have had Bishop Barron not brought him up mm-hmm. a few years ago. So I find it interesting that um, the reactions that I get from people uh, on Jordan Peterson, it, it, it's very interesting because some people will say, well, he's not Catholic, so we shouldn't listen to him. Well, that's a very strange tactic uh, to go about life. I mean, how many things are we closing ourselves off to that are, are true and useful and helpful? Uh, even in, in psychology, a lot of the statistics that you pull from in the book, I'm sure not all of these individuals are Catholic, but they're doing solid research. They're using the brain that God gave them to do good, credible, double-blind research, peer-reviewed research to determine what is true, albeit from the lens of natural reason. But there's nothing wrong with that. Not everything has to be a theological insight. Uh, even in scripture, we we have a literal sense and then these spiritual senses that that build on the literal sense. Uh, so that that interplay of faith and reason is so important. Uh, in your in your experience at the university, have you seen a shift in the students, um, particularly undergrads that are coming in? Have you seen any tendencies one way or another in that regard? Uh, I wouldn't say in regard to their fundamental understanding of faith and reason. Mm. Uh, I would say I do see shifts in other respects. So there seems to be, you might call it an increasing fragility among Mm. many students where they seem to be afraid of handling problems on their own, you might say. Mm. That is to say, you have many students whose parents will contact professors and say, you know, Johnny, you got to, you know, I see minus on this paper and I think this paper is really good. So it really should get, you know, an A or something that I don't remember happening, you know, years ago. So that's kind of a new development. And, and I think really unfortunate because by the time you're in college, I mean, you're a legal adult, Uh, you Mm -hmm. could get married, you could join the armed services. Uh, You really, you know, can vote. You, you really can and should be functioning like an adult. And, you know, I think that includes kind of handling your own business insofar as you can. So I'd say that's a kind of shift, I'd say, Hmm. in just the last few years. And maybe it's partly due to COVID, like people were kind of cooped up in their room for two years. And I don't know, I don't know if that's part of it, but, but anyway, I do see that. And uh, yeah, I'd say that's not a fantastic development. No, that it's uh, one part fascinating and one part pathetic. Um, maybe that's not the right term, but it sounds kind of pathetic, honestly. Um, I can't even wrap my head around that. I, I don't know if my parents knew about any of the things I was doing in college, um, let alone contacting a professor about a, a paper. Um, yeah, well, I mean, that, that has such uh, profound repercussions in the broader society because universities are supposed to be the place where people go to 
think for themselves, take on responsibility, um, think critically, learn how to reason, how to navigate interpersonal and interpersonal relationships and come out of it stronger and persevere. But I don't know how capable people are of that at this point. Um, so, huh, <laughs> what, what, what do you see, uh, as the, the first thing, like if you had all of the power to persuade people to go one direction or another, um, what, what would you do first, I guess, priorities wise, uh, to sort of right the ship? Uh, with respect to what in particular? Broader society. I would say young people in general who are trying to find meaning in their lives, trying to, um, navigate a world that maybe doesn't, uh, allow them to take personal responsibility. I'm putting a little bit of a value judgment in that question, but, um, what, I guess, what would you say to, uh, an undergrad, I'll put it, I'll give it a little bit more flesh. An undergraduate comes to your office and says, Dr. Kayser, what's the next step I should take to make my life fully my own? I think what I'd advise a student who came to my office uh, to do, uh, assuming for the sake of argument, the person was a person who had faith, is mm -hmm. to make time every single day to pray. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. So I'm talking about maybe 15 minutes uh, every morning to be with God. And the way a person prays, it seems to me, is not so important as the making time to pray. So prayer is just raising your mind and heart to God. And this can be done in lots of different ways. I mean, you could read uh, the Gospels very slowly and imagine yourself in that mm. situation. You could say the rosary. You could visit a chapel and just be in silence. Uh, you could write a letter to God. I have a, a book coming out in the fall called uh, Pray Like St. Augustine. And it basically mm. has kind of prompts for people to write letters to God. And you know that's one way to pray that I find very helpful. But I do think if someone prays and really tries to commune with God, really tries to get in touch with God and get a sense, hey, you know, where should I go? I think God does lead us. Yeah. You know, I think if we really ask, especially if we keep on asking, hey, what's the next step for me? I think if you ask that sincerely, that God makes it clear what the next step for you should be. And you're an individual, right? I'm an individual. So my next step may not be your next step and your next step may not be mine. And same is true for everybody. So I have no idea what would, you know, God would prompt you to do. Um, but I'll give you one example from my own life. I make time to pray every day. And basically, I don't know exactly what led to this, but, and I, I basically kind of got the feeling that God wanted me to stop drinking alcohol. And but, I wasn't like an alcoholic. I didn't never got arrested for DUI and uh, no, no big issues, but I just felt like, you know, this is just something God wants me to do. And so basically I haven't had any alcohol now for six months. And I know I feel like it's been really a big plus for me. So when, again, you know, I have no idea what, God would call any individual to do, but any, anything God is in fact, a calling from God is going to be a huge positive for the person. You know, God's not going to call you to, I'm going to, you know, eat a bunch of broken glass and, <laughs> you know, do something just terrible. I mean, this is going to be something that will help you to love God more and love other people more. And I think that's the whole purpose of life. So yeah. to be open to that, I think we need to make time for God and that involves prayer. And I think concretely, I'd say to the person, make it a specific time and place every day. So don't be like, well, I'll, I'll you know, pray sometime. I don't know when, I don't know where. That's not a great way to go. Uh, my habit is to get up, go to the bathroom, and first thing to pray, like <laughs> right away. And, you know, that works for me. Now, it may not work for everybody, but that is a habit I've had for a long time. And I think that's a good habit. But it could be, you know, I pray every day right after lunch. I pray every day right before dinner. I pray every day at, again, in general, I say for most people in the morning is better than the evening, but, you know, to make time for that. And again, the way that actual activity that someone does, there's lots of different good ways to pray. Again, like mm -hmm. exercise. You know, if someone said to me, oh, my health is really bad. 
I would say, hey, maybe you should try exercising. This is like super important for physical well-being. How should I exercise? Well, it's up to you. You know, walking is great for some people. Running is great for some people. You might do jujitsu. You might do tennis. You might go swimming. There's all kinds of things. But I think the real key is you've got to do it. Uh-huh. And it can't be once a month. It can't be once a week. It has to be like with exercise, you know, two, three, four times a week. You know, and with prayer, I'd say every day of the week. So you can think of it like brushing your teeth. I mean, most people don't get up and like, I'm going to decide, should I brush my teeth today? Yeah, I, I guess I will. You know, no, they just, it's every day they brush their teeth. So I think it, it, the world would be a much better place if every day when people got out of bed and went to the bathroom, brushed their teeth, and then made time for God. Amen. Yeah, it, it reminds me of uh, Pope Benedict in, in Deus Caritas, that's the first paragraph, being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea but an encounter with an event, a person that gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. That's not a once and done thing. That's a, that's a daily encounter. Um, the other thing it reminded me of, um, I think this might've been something that I, I think Jordan Peterson actually might've brought to my attention uh, with the best wording maybe is that perception is more like perceiving properly, perceiving correctly is more important than, knowledge or learning or uh, or knowing um that to be able to see something and see it properly and clearly has more benefit which i think just speaks to what you're saying about intentionality right that that you can't just and you talk about this in the book you you say you can't just say blandly i'm going to exercise more you have to say i'm going to do this action at this time like it has to be specific yeah, yeah. And, the probability of you carrying out a good intention goes way, way up if you're very concrete and specific and you have bright lines. So again, yeah, with exercise, you know, say, well, I'm going to exercise more. That's great. That's great. But it's much more likely going to happen if you say, I'm going to walk every morning at nine o'clock and I'm going to walk for half an hour or whatever your thing is. I'm going to play tennis. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with my friends, you know, Frank, and we're going to meet at the tennis club at five or whatever, meet at the courts at five, and we're going to play. That's much more likely to happen than, oh, sometime when I get around to it, I'll play tennis. I mean, that could be a year before you get around to it, right? Mm -hmm. It's much better to have the bright lines. You have a a set time, a set place. and, And really, I think, honestly, ideally every day, and the the reason is that if it if it's just too, I think if if you said Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that's more likely to happen than just two days a week or three days mm-hmm. a week when it's up in the air when it's going to be. So it's it just better, much better for any habit, anything you want to do, make it very concrete, very specific. You know, again, every morning at eight thirty, uh, every evening at seven. You know, and again, okay, of course, life happens. You know, some someone in your family needs to go to the ER. Okay, well, maybe that day you can't do your normal schedule. But for most of us, right, 95% of our day is very similar to what happened before. I mean, most days you're not running straight to the emergency room, right? I mean, most days you're just not a normal day, right? It's a normal day. And what you do on a normal day is going to shape your life dramatically, either for the good or for bad. So, yes, of course, you can't plan every day out and there's going to be, you know, unexpected things, emergencies. But that's a different matter, right? That's, that's rare. That's unusual. But, but I think it's, I think it's really wise to try to make your schedule and your routine, something that's very, um, very much moving you towards good habits, moving you to the right place. So good habits in terms of, in terms of prayer, good habits in terms of physical well-being, exercise and food, good habits in terms of, uh, you know, the ethical life, right? So, you know, do we make time to, do something courageous to do, to exercise our, our practical wisdom, to exercise our temperance. You know, I mean, we, again, we can choose to do that. So mm-hmm. anyway, I, I think for me, those are things that have been important things I've learned. And, you know, obviously I'm still trying to progress down the road and, you know, figure things out and, and grow. But, but I feel like for me, at least these things have been really helpful to, to think about and to try to do. Well, I, I just finished the book, um, just a couple of days yesterday, actually, I had finished reading it knowing this interview was coming and it's, it's full of practical wisdom. Um, that's not just sort of 
your thoughts. Right? These are these are well researched, uh, solid, rational, tangible things. Things that we can put into practice in a real uh, intentional way. Something that um, can assist anyone. It is very universal. You leave enough room open. Um, like you say, you don't have to exercise this way. You could exercise in a whole uh, bunch of different ways. But the the things that are contained in on how to be happy is something that all of us want. We all want to be happy. And this gives us some practical guidance to actually move forward in that. So thank you for for sharing it with everyone and especially for Word on Fire for making it so accessible. Um, most of the time, downloaded ebooks that are free are not this good. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Um, but I, I, we're about at the half hour mark, so I know I wanted to uh, honor our time there. But any anything you'd like to to share or add or uh, plug in a particular way, Dr. Kaiser? Uh, no, well, I appreciate you having me on to talk about these things. And again, since it's a free book, you know, I hope everybody is able to download that and benefit from it because, you know, I want people to really, you know, have a better life and not everyone has the time that I do to research everything and look up all this stuff. And so what I've tried to do is make it very useful for people and now it's, you know, convenient and cost-free. So I think there's some benefits to it. So thanks for discussing all this with me. Yeah. Thanks for coming on and, and thanks for uh, sharing what you did. Uh, where, where can people find uh, some of your other work in, obviously Amazon, but do you have a, a website? Uh, I do. I have a website at LMU and I'm on uh, Twitter or X at professor or prof underscore Kaiser. Great. And so I try to tweet, you know, semi-regularly. Not, I'm not like a super tweeter, but, um, but anyway, so I'm, I'm there. I'm on Facebook also. So people can follow. I post things on there. I, I try to write or I do write uh, two articles a month for Word on Fire. So Great. people are interested in my work. They can, I think you can sign up at Word on Fire and get like the, an email when a new article comes out or something. But uh, but I like doing that. It's fun. I'm, I'm working on an article now. It's not out yet, but it's called um, If 2 Plus 2 Equals 4, Then God Exists. So it's kind of a fun fun article, but we'll see if, if I convince the, the new atheists. I, I'm, <laughs> good luck with that. It may not happen. Um, for those listening, go to gooddistinctions.com to subscribe. And uh, Dr. Kayser, thanks so much. Thanks for helping us learn how to be happy. Thank you.